This time of year is wonderful, isn't it? I mean, you think about the eggnog, maybe good, maybe bad. Time with family, exchanging gifts. It really is a wonderful time of year. But also, it's stinking stressful. We get busy, we make all of these commitments, we've got to go to this Christmas party and that Christmas party and, and try to get all the gifts together. There's, there's financial stresses. There's also sometimes stresses inside of families. Let, let's be honest, right? You're, you're seeing some family members that you don't always see, and that can bring up some, some family tensions. And I was thinking about December, reading this section of scripture, going, I think there's a lot in December that would cause us to rely upon God's wisdom. Say, Lord, would you just give me wisdom for the next couple weeks? Uh, do you want to be burnt out December 26th? Is that where you want to be? Like just completely bitter and burnt out, broke, looking forward to next Christmas. Woo, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. Or do you want to come to December 26th and go, man, I, I've had the wisdom of God. I've met with the Lord. But I'm also sure for a lot of us, yeah, there's the trials of December and Christmas. But you probably have some things that are going on in your life that are pretty core and pretty difficult. It's an interesting time economically. Uh, the feds decided not to raise the interest rate, which is nice, like a little bit of relief there. Inflation doesn't seem to be going up quite, quite as high, but we know that finances are uncertain. And you may really be feeling that the prep is financially. You may have a loved one that's passed away this year that's not gonna be gathering with you at, at Christmas time. You maybe have received a, a difficult diagnosis of cancer or, or someone that you love is going through cancer. You may be estranged from a mom or a dad, or you may be going through a divorce that, that you don't want. There's so many challenges and difficulties in life. There, there may be this sense of despair and depression that's over your soul. Well, this section of scripture encourages us in trial to have all joy. Think about some things that you're just stoked about. You know, all joy. I see a 49ers hoodie right here. I, I don't know if I should say this out loud, but I've never really pulled for the 49ers, but I'm kind of liking the 49ers this year. They've got a quarterback, Brock, that was picked last year, the last in the draft, Mr. Inre uh, Irrelevant. And he's doing great last year and this year. And I find myself kind of rooting for him, right? And you might be a, a 49ers fan or a Broncos fan and your team wins the Super Bowl and that's all joy. You maybe get a raise and, and that's all joy. Some of you are recently married and you're like, oh man, it's, it's all joy. We oftentimes think of all joy as our circumstances are going according to plan or even better than we expected. But the challenge here from James is that in trial, we could experience joy. Let's look at verse one. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's James? If you're new to this letter, it's actually the half-brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus who became a believer after the resurrection of Christ. So Mary and Joseph went on to have kids. James was one of those. Imagine your older brother being Jesus. Talk about the golden boy. Can't you be more like Jesus, right? So he grew up with, with Jesus as an older brother. Now, imagine you're playing with Jesus and your other siblings, and there's a fight that breaks out, and you're like, Jesus did it. He was the one. Jesus did it. They're like, no, no, Jesus didn't do it. James, you did it. You, you go to your room, right? It's time for some punishment to come your way. And they were skeptics, James and his siblings, of Christ being the Messiah until the resurrection of Christ. And it's the resurrection of Christ, the empty tomb, that wins skeptics. He becomes a believer, becomes a leader in the early church. We're going to learn more about James coming up in Acts, Acts chapter 15 on the weekends. He doesn't introduce himself as the half-brother of Jesus. He introduces himself as the bondservant of God. He's got a lot of clout here. I'm the half-brother of Jesus. He could really go a long ways with that. But instead, he says, I am a slave by choice. That's what bondservant means. I'm a slave by choice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, 
to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So he's writing to Jewish believers that are scattered abroad. Now, earlier in the book of Acts, we saw that there was persecution that happened to the Jewish church that caused them to scatter. This is a little bit later on in church history where there was anti-Semitism in the world to such a great degree that they were having to scatter. This is quoted by Josephus, a, a Jewish historian. There is no city, no tribe, whether Greek or barbarian, in which Jewish law and Jewish customs have not uh, taken root. And so there was this influence of, of Judaism throughout the world and ultimately that anti-Semitism rose and persecution came upon all Jews, including Jewish believers, and they're, they're dispersed. And that's the context in which James is writing to this group of people that are going through such a persecution. It's interesting, here we are in December of 2023, and anti-Semitism is on the rise. I've been watching things take place since October 7th, Hamas attacks Israel, and somehow now Israel is under more scrutiny than Hamas. You know, any other country gets attacked by, by terrorists to defend themselves is not questioned, but for Israel to attack themselves, then all of a sudden there's this, this hatred that's there towards the, the nation of Israel. And if you look throughout history, there's these different moments in time where anti-Semitism just is on the rise. And ultimately, there's a demonic element to that. Satan wants to destroy the nation of Israel. Did you guys watch the news last week where four major universities, their president, were brought into Congress where they had to testify on some of their stances towards Israel with their students. And, and the president of University of Pennsylvania was asked, you know, if one of your students was propagating for the genocide of Jews, what would the University of Pennsylvania do? So let's think about that. You're a student at Penn and you're saying, I think all Jews should be killed. There should just be a genocide of all Jews. And the president for the University of Pennsylvania said, well, as long as they didn't act upon it, it would be fine. So you could say it as long as you wanted, but as long as you didn't act on it, it would be fine. So I guess you can be a student at the University of Pennsylvania and say that all Jews should be annihilated. Well, the next day, a donor pulled $100 million from the University of Pennsylvania. The next day just pulled, pulled the money, and then there was a lot of outrage, and you can see why, and this president uh, had to resign. They, they pushed for her uh, resignation. But, but that was a big moment that took place just last week in Congress, and so you see it at different times in history. This is a moment where these Jews are, are being persecuted, and these are the words that James writes to them. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Try to put yourself in the shoes where you're being forced out of your home because you're a Jewish believer. You're dispersed. What would that be like to be pushed out of Colorado Springs with being able to take very few of your possessions? Would you count it all joy when you fell into that difficult trial? Trials and joy seem to be an oxymoron, don't they? Like civil war. How is war ever civil? Or icy hot? Doesn't seem to, to go together. How about this one? Mall food. It's just, it's really not food, right? Pretty good. It's, it's an oxymoron. Alone together. <laughs> a new classic or a smart bomb. Here's one we've all experienced. Family vacation. How do, how do those two tend to go together, right? Right? So count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I like the way James puts this where he says just various trials because there's very big trials, the death of a loved one, a, a car accident that results in getting paralyzed, all of these very tragic things that happen in life. But then there's also the furnace broke. Now, is that a big deal? Yeah, it's going to be cold tonight. Some, some pipes could break. But does it compare to a loved one passing away? No, but it's still annoying. It's, it's still difficult. 
you've got a, a very hard boss to deal with. That, that's a trial. But maybe not quite as difficult as being diagnosed with, with cancer. So whether it's one on the scale or 10 on the scale or somewhere in between, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And James is going to tell us why. Why we should consider it joy. But think of this phrase, count it, count it. It's to determine the number of. It's a mathematical phrase. It's reciting numbers in ascending order. It's two plus two is four. That's about as far as I'm going to go tonight with my math skills. But it's taking the time to stop and think, to pray, to meditate upon the Lord and go, this seems bad, but God's word tells me that he is working in this situation, so I'm actually going to count it joy. I'm going to consider it joy that I'm in this trial, that I'm in this, this difficulty. So here's the first reason why. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So a trial is going to test your faith. The idea is to show the quality of your faith. I'm sure where these chairs were manufactured, they tested them. And the purpose wasn't to destroy the chair. The purpose was to test the quality. And God is going to test our faith, not to try to destroy it, but to reveal to us what is the quality of our faith. Now, it's easy to say, Lord, I trust you. But then we go through a trial and we're really challenged. Do I trust you? One of the things that's good about a test is it does reveal where your ability is. So you take that math test, you take that reading test, you, you take the English test and it reveals, okay, it, it's about average or it's really good or you've got some room for improvement or you actually failed, failed this test. And so how do I know my heart? How do I know the condition of my faith and my trust in the Lord? It, it, go through a hard time. And that hard time is going to reveal where my faith is at. God sent the children of Israel into the wilderness. One of the reasons was to reveal their heart, Deuteronomy tells us. Now, does God know their heart? Absolutely. But they need to know their heart. They need to know what's going on inside of them. And so one of the blessings that happens with the trial is it's like, okay, I come to understand where my faith is or where my faith isn't. Isn't it an amazing moment in scripture, in Job's life, when all of his children die at the, the same moment, he loses his possessions and he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, Job suffered greatly as you read the book of Job. But I think in that moment, you can say, man, there's some faith there. I don't know that I could respond in that way. That, that trial revealed the genuineness of his faith. But also, the trial's going to produce something. It, it produces patience. And this is several places in scripture. Patience is steadfastness. In Romans chapter 5, Paul writes about the same truth. He says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Those first few verses of Romans 5 is glorying in justification, glorying in that we have peace with God, that we have grace that God has given to us. But not only that, we also glory in tribulations. We, we glory in hard times. We, we count it all joy because tribulation is producing perseverance. It's producing steadfastness. How do we get that godly character of steadfastness, of endurance? Well, it comes through hard times. It comes through trials. That's the way that spiritual muscle is built up. But then perseverance, character. We desire godly character. Sometimes we pray for godly character. And the Lord answers that with trials. He, he teaches us through, through trials. And then hope, that confidence of, in God in the midst of, of difficulties. Henry Beecher said this, We are always on the anvil. By trials, God is shaping us for higher things. 
Trials is that hammer. We're on the anvil and, and God is shaping us into to his image. It's a challenging quote from C.S. Lewis. We can in- ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being appen- intended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. We can ignore pleasure. You can go through times of blessing and miss the Lord completely. He he whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. Unfortunately, there's nothing that gets my attention more than pain. It's pain that causes me to be broken before the Lord. It's pain that causes me to rely upon the Lord. It's it's pain that, that humbles me. God in his economy goes, I love my children. I love my my sheep, my sons, my daughters, and I love them enough to allow them to go through trial and to go through pain. It's actually going to produce good things in their life. Paul, he writes about trial in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and he says that trial is producing something of eternal weight and glory. So it's impacting us now, but it's also resulting in something that's worthwhile for eternity. Because when we go through hard times, it causes us to know Jesus better, it causes us to see what's really important in life, and that trial now can result in something in eternity that's eternal weight and glory. I wonder if we could see things from God's perspective, from an eternal perspective, if we'd go, okay, I'm okay with some suffering in this life, because it's going to result in eternal glory. It's not going to be wasted. I want you to hear me on this. I I hope that God's in this message tonight. That God brought this group of people together on this snowy Wednesday night. You're going through trial is to know it's not wasted. God's using it in your life. It's an opportunity to know Jesus better. It's an opportunity to grow. It's, It's an opportunity to be used by the Lord. But here's the challenge in verse four, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This is the yielding to the steadfastness. This is the yielding to the patience. Let patience have its perfect work. Yeah, I enjoy doing some running, have done a few half marathons, not a big deal to a lot of other runners. This winter, I've gotten into rowing. I got a rowing machine for for my basement and been having fun with that. It's really humbling. There's an app with a workout of the day and you can post it in your age group with other men your age. And I'm a terrible rower. It's like all these guys rowing throughout the world. And it's like, man, this is not very good, right? But there's an aspect, if you're going to run, you just got to give in to the pain. You just have to embrace the pain. You're like, I am on mile six I've got 13.1 miles to do, and I feel terrible. And this is a terrible idea, and there's no way I'm going to make it, right? And you just have to say, I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to embrace the pain. Like you're rowing, and you're like, what am I down here rowing for? This, this, I should be watching TV or surfing on my phone, right? This, this is a ridiculous idea. And, and you just have to give in to it. You have to embrace it. You have to yield to it. This is going to be hard, but it's good for me. And it results in, in something that's good. And, and in trials, a lot of times we, we just want out. Like, I, I want out of this difficult situation. I, I want to get away from this person that's sandpaper to my soul. That's so hard for, for me to deal with. I'm just, I'm just ready for my car to work. I'll, I'll do anything just to get a different car. I'm so tired of of this car and having to take it to the mechanic. I'm so tired of this job. I'm so tired of this. I I just want out of it. What if we stopped? And a lot of our prayers are in that way. Lord, just get me out of the trial. What if we sat down in the hot sand for a little bit and said, Lord, what do you want to teach me? It's that yielding. I'm yielding to the trial. I'm surrendering to the trial. I'm surrendering to the perseverance. It's going to be painful. Am I going to trust the Lord if this trial doesn't go away? 
And it's there that the growth starts to take place. It's there that the Lord begins to, to work in our lives. But let patience have it perf- its work. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Does trial always result in growth? No. There's some people that go through tremendous trial, and what happens? They get bitter. They get bitter. But yet then there's others that go through trial, and they know Jesus in a greater way. There's transformational work that happens. What's the difference? I think it's the yielding. It's how we respond and saying, I want to respond in faith. I want to respond in surrender. I want to respond in in trust. Yield to that trial. Yield to that, that difficulty. What might the fruit look like on the other side? What what might your marriage look like in five or ten more years as you continue to press into Christ and and towards each other? What may God have in store inside of that job that you're enduring in? How is God going to use that physical difficulty in our lives for your glory? If any of you lacks wisdom, here's the need. As we're going through trial, it exposes, man, I lack wisdom. I need God to give me wisdom for this particular trial. Do you lack wisdom? Well, let's talk about wisdom for for just a moment. Wisdom is more than knowledge. Wisdom is knowledge applied, and that's a big difference. So you know it, but then you also do something with it. Because just knowing something without the application really isn't wisdom. You could say that that's foolishness. You've heard me give this illustration before probably, but you know, you've got your gas light in your car. So the gas light goes on. What does wisdom do? You stop and go to the gas station, right? You apply the knowledge. They call it an idiot light for a reason. Because the gas light goes on, you ignore it, you ignore it. You're like me, you've read the manual. Gas light goes on, I've got three gallons before I'm going to run out of gas. I start doing the math, and you guessed it. I've probably run out of gas like 10 times since Amber and I have been married. Now, that is 22 years, but that's a lot of times for 22 years. Amber, like, gets gas before the gas light even goes on, right? But I'll I'll tend to roll the dice a, a little bit. I remember a few years ago, like, I ran out of gas just outside of my neighborhood. It was really early in the morning before the sun came up, like this time of winter, And my neighbor pulls up next to me. He's like, Eric, what are you doing? I'm like, I ran out of gas. (laughs) He starts laughing at me. He's like, get in the car. Let's go to the gas station, right? Gets a gas can and and helps me out. But, But wisdom, wisdom is knowledge applied. What is it in your life tonight where you're like, man, I, I need wisdom. The Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Solomon's writing this book, as he was a new king, he cried out to the Lord for wisdom and God granted it to him. And in Proverbs, it talks about wisdom being more valuable than gold. A lot of times we're pursuing finances and God says, are you pursuing wisdom? Really looking for God's truth and being able to apply it to our hearts and our lives. Wisdom is personified as a woman in the book of Proverbs and and she cries out saying, will anyone listen to me? Will we listen to the voice of wisdom? There's also the woman of folly who's crying out for an audience. So we see this need for wisdom. If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally or generously and without reproach and it will be given him. So, so God's not just going to dump wisdom into our lives. He's going to wait for us to ask. And trials reveal how much we need wisdom. Okay, I don't have what I need. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the strength. God, I need you to meet me in this. But God waits for us to ask. Solomon asked for wisdom, and God gave it to him. We see Esther going before the king to plead on behalf of her people, the Jewish people, and and she asked for prayer. She said, I need wisdom. I need God's intervention. Daniel, having to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, asked for prayer. He was asking God for wisdom, right? Let him ask. 
If, if we don't ask, we're not going to receive this, this wisdom. We've got an awesome description of Jesus in Isaiah that he's the wonderful counselor. He's ready to provide wisdom. So let's ask of God. And God wants to give wisdom. In fact, he gives it liberally without reproach. Generously without reproach. I was thinking about my great aunt Bertha. She would, never had kids and her husband passed away earlier in her life. So she was a widow for a lot of years. I knew her in her 80s and 90s. I was born in Grants Pass, Oregon. She lived in Rogue River, about seven miles away. And we, we would visit her probably once or twice a month. I can't remember one time where she didn't offer ice cream. It didn't matter if you visited her at 10 in the morning or two or six at night. She's like, do you want some ice cream? And it was always vanilla. She was never without ice cream and she gave it generously. She gave it liberally, right? And my mom, I think normally would say, hey, no ice cream, it's 10 in the morning. But she knew how much it meant to Aunt Bertha to just load us up with ice cream. So we would just sit at her little table and eat ice cream. And then she had the, the weirdest salt and pepper shakers. She had this collection of salt and pepper shakers that were on the wall, like just hundreds of them. And you're eating your ice cream going, that's a really creepy owl. But, you know, I'll just keep eating this ice cream. But Aunt Bertha loved the Lord, you know, and she, she just loved to to pour it on and pour it on generously. And that, that's the heart of our father is he's ready to give it. He, he's just ready to generously pour out wisdom if we'll, we'll ask. And he does it without reproach. He does it without shame. He does it without like, oh, you've already got your quote on wisdom. You've already asked too many times for wisdom. Oh, you didn't read your Bible today. You don't get any wisdom. Oh, you're struggling. You, you don't get any wisdom. He doesn't do any of that. If you ask, he's ready. He's ready to dump it on. Double, triple scoop of wisdom. It'll be given. But here's the conditions. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So, so God says, ask and I'll give it. But I want you to ask in faith. I want you to believe that I'm a loving father that desires and is able to give wisdom. As we read a little further in James chapter one, it, it describes God as the father of lights. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. He, he's good. He gives every good and perfect gift. And for us to understand the nature of our father and go, well, you promised wisdom, so I'm gonna trust that you're gonna give it. I know who you are and, and I'm putting my trust in you. I'm, I'm asking in faith and I'm believing that you're going to give it to me. If we come to the Lord and say, Lord, would you please give me wisdom? But I'm not really sure if you have wisdom for this situation. Maybe this situation has outstumped you. Thankfully, God's never up in heaven going, man, I, I don't know what to do with this one. Wow, Eric, you really came up with a complex one here. I don't have any wisdom to give to you. So to understand, God, you have wisdom and you desire to give it to you and I'm gonna trust that. So don't go by our feelings, but by who we know God to be. So what do we do if we go, you know what? Well, my faith is struggling because sometimes the trial gets so intense where our faith is, is struggling, isn't it? I think we would all say, I've been there. You might be there uh, tonight. I think there's some specific things we can do if our faith is struggling, and the first is be honest with God. The man who came to Jesus in the Gospels, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Be honest with God. Lord, I'm struggling to trust you in this, this manner. And the second is get into the word. Romans 10 tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Read it, listen to it, and as you're listening to God's word, reading God's word, it's going to build you up in faith. And the last, and it's the most important for me, is to look at the cross. Look at God giving his son for us. If we trust God for salvation, we can trust him with what we're going through and trust his character. God, I know you're good. I know you love me because of the cross. My emotions are telling me differently, but I'm choosing to trust in you. 
Now, if we don't ask in faith, it says that we're like a wave that's tossed by the wind. If you've watched the ocean in a windstorm, that wave just gets thrown back and forth. And that's what we're like if we're not trusting in the Lord. That circumstance, that difficulty, that trial is, is controlling us and we're, we're just doubting and we're getting tossed to and fro, back and forth, and we're not gonna receive this wisdom that God promises. So this is the challenge. This is the hard part, is if I go, you know what, I'm going through trial and I'm asking for wisdom, but I seem like God is not answering. Where do you think the problem lies? Probably with me. Because God's promised to give wisdom if I'll ask in faith. So there's probably something lacking in my faith. There's something amiss in my faith. And don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that we have faith and then we're going to get the outcome that we want. I'm saying if we have faith, then God is going to grant to us wisdom. And maybe my unbelief is preventing me from receiving the wisdom that God desires to give. And then our last verse says, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What's, what's double-minded? Mm, I love you, I love you not. I love you, I love you not. The Broncos are awesome, I hate the Broncos, right? <laughs> it's just this fickleness, it's this back and forth. I'm, I'm double-minded, Sometimes God provides wisdom, but yet we don't trust it. It's, it makes sense to us in the moment, but then we talk ourselves out of the wisdom that God has provided. We don't want to be double-minded. We don't want to be in that place of going back and forth. But, but if we're doubting, then we'll be double-minded and we'll be tossed to and fro. I got to tell you, when I'm in a place of doubting and I'm double-minded and I'm in a trial that is a no fun place to be. Because you just feel worked by the trial and you feel worked by the difficulty. But if we can go through a process of saying, Lord, I'm choosing to trust in you. The situation might change, but there's that wisdom that comes from God. There's that wisdom that comes from above that provides the strength that, that we need. So let me ask you a few questions tonight. And the first is, is how do I view the trials I'm in? Are there a few trials that you're in where you're starting to get angry about them or frustrated or bitter? I mean, how do we view the trials that we're in? Do we count them all joy? Am I running from the trials or am I allowing God to mold me? Am I just putting all of my work and my energy trying to, to get away from this trial, get away from this difficulty, or am I allowing this trial to mold me? Am I asking for God's wisdom in faith? Am I asking for God's wisdom in faith? I'm just imagining God is our Father watching us, maybe like a hamster on a wheel, and we're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. And don't you kind of want to just speak to the hamster and go, hey, there's a better way to live why don't you get off the wheel? Brother, you're, you're just wearing yourself out. And God's watching us in the midst of the trial and he's saying, when are you gonna ask me? When are you gonna ask me? When are you gonna ask for wisdom? When are you gonna ask in faith? When are you gonna respond to the wisdom that I so generously wanna give, give to you? So tonight, if you're in trial, you're in difficulty, ask, Lord, what is it? What would you want me to do? And it's various trials, big, small, anything in between. And as we celebrate communion, to know the heart of God, that he wants to give wisdom to us. It may be as simple of, Lord, how do I navigate these next 13 days, these next 12 days between now and Christmas? How do I navigate this, this family member? Or it could be a lot deeper, a lot more difficult things in our lives to say, Lord, I just keep seemingly beating my head against the wall. And what is it? What is it, Lord, that you want to teach me? I want to listen. I want to hear for, for the wisdom that you would provide. And then see the, the breakthroughs that God brings in our lives. Well, please stand with me and let's, let's pray together.
Father, we thank you that you love us and that you're with us. We don't fully understand why you allow trials in our lives, but we do see that you use them in our lives to teach us more about you and develop godly character. And we ask for wisdom. Let's take a moment to to wait upon the Lord just to, to seek him right now. What is it in your life that you need wisdom for? Big or small, somewhere in between. And, and ask, and ask in faith. What is it that every week seems to get the best of you? What is it that you're worried about tonight? Father, we do believe that you love us, that you're our dad. You've shown us your, your character by giving us your son. And you tell us in your word that you'll give wisdom generously. So w- would you grant wisdom? Lord, and we're honest with you with where our faith is at. Or we believe, but help our unbelief. Would, would you grow our, our trust in you? Would you meet us afresh at the communion table? In Jesus' name, amen.